Uh, while this is running, uh, Brooks and I will be in the chat room with you answering questions. You can really help right. us out. Solving the paperless puzzle. I've been going paperless since about 2008 and needless to say, I've tried all sorts of different tools, all sorts of different workflows, all sorts of different techniques. And I've kind of settled on a routine that has worked really well for me and I think it'll work really well for you. So what I thought I'd do is share some of the best practices, some of the things that I've found over the years that really, really work for going paperless and staying there. And we're gonna talk about that word paperless in a little bit. Now, a lot of times when you hear about going paperless, you're hearing it kind of in the context of going green. People say that's why they wanna go paperless because they wanna go green. And if that's your reason for doing it, that's cool. I haven't found that to be the biggest benefit for me. And that's not a really big driver for me. Another thing you hear about going paperless is the benefit of having this totally clean, pristine, minimalist, uncluttered desk. That hasn't really also been a really big driver for me. A lot of people really like that aspect of it. I'm not somebody who get really gets fussy about that sort of thing. So it's not really been a big benefit for me, but it definitely is nice not having papers all over the place. For me though, when I think about going paperless, I think of the biggest benefit that I've found over the years is this ability to be productive. This ability to have the information that you need right when you need it, right at your fingertips from wherever you are. That's what's been really great for me about going paperless. And so we're going to talk about going paperless and we're going to talk about it from three main perspectives. The first is how do we eliminate paper? If we have some paper, how do we get rid of at least some of that paper? The next thing we're gonna look at is designing a paperless workflow. How can we have all of the parts move together so that we take that paper and turn it into an electronic document we can do something with? And finally, we're gonna look at how you protect your electronic information. How do you keep your electronic information safe and secure? And before we get into the moving parts and all the bells and whistles around going paperless, what I'd like to do is talk about that paper elephant in the room, that word paperless, because it can definitely create different reactions from different people. So what does this word paperless mean? Well, for me, going paperless does not necessarily mean getting rid of all of the paper in your life, getting rid of all of the paper in your business. First of all, that's probably not gonna happen. And second of all, you might not even want it to happen. There may be some paper that you like using. If you like using a notebook, go ahead and use it. If you like reviewing materials, holding the piece of paper in your hand and marking it up with a red pen, go ahead and do that. Going paperless does not mean taking paper away from you and making you do things that you don't wanna do. Really for me, going paperless is being more intentional and mindful about the paper that you're using and being more intentional and mindful of the paper that you're keeping and making sure that every piece of paper that you use is actually doing a job for you. You're in control of your paper. Your paper is not in control of you. That's for me what going paperless means. So with that being said, what are some benefits of going paperless? What are some things that people have found that is really helpful around going paperless, whatever that word means for you? And the first thing, is paper just takes up physical space. Anyone who has a bulging filing cabinet, that's kind of how I started going on my paperless journey. I was moving and I had this bulging filing cabinet and I was saying to my wife, why are we moving all this paper that we don't even need 99% of it? So that's what sent me down this road. So paper just takes up physical space. The next thing is paper is not searchable. You can do some tricks around, you know, the way you label your files and stuff like that. But if you're looking for a piece of information, you have to find where that piece of paper is. You have to find where in the piece of paper that information is. And it just takes a lot more time than searching electronic documents. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Paper is not shareable. So if I'm working on a project and I need to work with you on that document, I have to either give you that document which means I don't have it anymore, or I have to make a copy of it, which is just adding to this physical paper problem that we've been talking about. So paper is not inherently shareable. And with paper, there's very limited backup. So if I spill a cup of coffee on this piece of paper that I have, or if I misfile it, which happens all the time, it's a huge cost in organizations, is the cost of misfiled documents, or if something gets stolen out of my bag, my, you know, my bag gets stolen out of my trunk and it has some important documents, that's gone. And again, yes, of course, you can have backup copies of paper, 
But again, that's adding to all these other problems that we've been talking about. So those are some of the kind of downsides of paper that going paperless can help with. You might have some of these reasons that resonate with you. Maybe you have other reasons, that's totally cool. Still though, this word paperless can evoke a bit of a reaction. For example, this was a comment I had on my Facebook page once. Uh, it's, if you can't read it, it's all in capitals. It says, like paper, stupid idea. So I get it, people love paper and going paperless may not be for everybody, that's totally cool. But I think a lot of that comes with misunderstanding about what the word paperless actually means. So with that all said, let's get going and let's start talking about how we eliminate some paper. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we can all agree maybe there's some paper that you want to minimize or get rid of in your life. How do we go about doing that? Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna start with the goal. What is it that you're actually trying to do here? If you are gonna go paperless, whatever that means to you, what is that actually going to look like? Because once you have that end goal defined, then you can start working towards it. The next thing you want to do is examine your paper. So this can be a really, really useful exercise. Take a look at where paper is coming into your life or your business. Is it coming in via the mail? Where is it coming from? Is it coming in from kids' backpacks from school? I know for me, that's a pretty significant source of paper in our family. Is it self-generated? Anyone who's worked in an office is familiar with that paper tray sitting beside the printer that people have printed out documents but then just left them there. So where is this paper coming from and where is it going to? And what you'll find is of this paper that's coming in, there's a lot of it that you can just eliminate right away. Maybe you can uh, get off some junk mail lists. Maybe you can unsubscribe from some catalogs. Maybe you can go to some vendors and say, hey, I'd rather this be paperless if that's something you choose to do. So after that, you'll be able to whittle down the paper that's coming in and you'll find that you're able to eliminate quite a bit of it. And for the paper that's left, if you choose to have it coming in as paper, that's totally cool, but at least you've made that decision. Now, we think of going paperless as this big change that you're going through, but really it doesn't have to be a huge change. You can start small, just start in one particular type of bill or one particular, if you're in an organization, maybe one particular uh, process or workflow or one particular department. You can start small and then kind of build it out from there. And that can be a really helpful way to work out the kinks in a small scale and then build it out. And finally, what you wanna do is once you've made that first cut, you've gone through, you've started small, you've examined your paper, you've looked at what you can eliminate and you've gone through and you've eliminated some of it, periodically review it. Because what you'll find is after you work out the kinks and you get things going and you like this new paperless lifestyle, even if it's just a small part, there's always more later you could go back and maybe you can do things a little bit more efficiently or maybe there's some documents that once you're comfortable then you can look at shifting to electronic you want to periodically review and making continuous small changes these small changes really add up over time okay once we've gone through and we've eliminated some paper then it's time to start building out our paperless workflow it's time to start figuring out how do we take paper make it electronic and then do something with it. And that's called your paperless workflow. And the most common place that we all start, once we figured out that goal and how it looks like in the end goal, which we talked about earlier, is capturing paper. How do we take our physical paper and make it electronic? And the most common way to do that, and you can see that there in the picture, is with a scanner. That's a document scanner that you see there that the person's uh, pressing the button on. And so there's all sorts of different types of scanners. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll start with the scanner that we have. So maybe for some people that is just a flatbed scanner that they've had around, or for others, maybe it's an all-in-one device that has a scanner built in. You can definitely start there. What you may find is that if it's the type of scanner where you have to scan one side and then take it out and flip it over and scan another side and then take it out and put it in the next page and do it one by one like that, it can be really slow and can end up being quite frustrating. And for a change like this, what you want to do is you want to reduce friction as much as possible. You want to eliminate anything that's annoying in the paperless process as much as you can, because it's gonna be much more likely that you're gonna stick with it. So if you have a decent volume of paper to deal with, either at the beginning or on an ongoing basis, 
you may want to look at having an actual document scanner. There's actually scanners that are designed for exactly what we're trying to do when going paperless. There's lots of different types of scanners out there. Some of the features you want to look for, ideally, is you want to look for a scanner that has a document feeder built in. So you take a stack of paper, you put it in the scanner, you hit a button, and it will whip through and scan all those documents. You don't have to feed them in one by one. The second thing you want to look for is have a duplex scanner, so a double-sided scanner that can scan both sides at the same time. This can make things a lot faster and a lot more convenient. Again, there's lots of different types of scanners out there. Some of the more common models I see out there is uh, the Epson you see there on the right. They have some different models. They're a, a really nice scanner and a pretty good price point as well. I'm not personally a fan of their software, but some people like it. One nice thing about the Epson scanners is they have what's called a Twain compatibility built in. So if you have some specialized software that relies on that, and it's one of those things that if you need it, you probably know that you need it, but the Epson does have that. So it can integrate with some more programs. The scanner that I personally use is called the ScanSnap. You see there on the left, it's a really fast scanner, really, really high reviews really easy to use and really efficient software. So I personally like the ScanSnap. It's not Twain compatible and we can talk more in the questions if you wanna learn more about that. But I have personally have never found the lack of Twain compatibility to be a problem as long as I've been using it. But that's the scanner that I personally use. So these are desktop scanners that you put on your desktop and you scan. Both of them have smaller models like personal models or even uh, portable models that you can take around with you. So there's all sorts of different types of and form factors of scanner depending on how you need to use them and depending on how much you want to spend, of course, and how much paper you have to deal with. Now, there's kind of an interesting shift going on in the paperless scanning industry, and that is that more and more people are actually doing away with a scanner altogether. They're actually using their mobile devices to scanner, their smartphones and their tablets. So what you can do, and these apps have gotten really, really good, also because the cameras have gotten really, really good, is you can actually hold your phone over a document, it will scan it, digitize it, and in a lot of cases, clean it up and make it look almost as good as if it was scanned with an actual physical paper scanner. There's lots of different specific apps that are built for scanning. So for example, Scanner Pro and ScanBot are good ones on iOS. Actually, ScanBot is cross-platform iOS and Android. If you're an Evernote user, the Evernote app has a great document scanner built in, and Scannable is an iOS app that Evernote makes. That's also a really good one. And versions of iOS that are coming up actually have document scanning built right into it. So this is something that's just gonna get more and more powerful and more and more popular. If you're somebody who has really big documents, you probably don't wanna sit there and scan it with your phone, but you could. But for those capturing one-off scans, smartphones and tablets are actually making really good scanners. And it's kind of like that saying they've always had about the camera. The best camera is the one you have with you. Well, it's kind of going that way with a lot of document scanning as well. The best scanner you have is the one that you have with you and they'll, you'll actually use to capture that paper quickly. Really handy for stuff like receipts and capturing information in the field, if that's something you need to do. Now, once you've captured information, of course, then you need to figure out somewhere where it can go. And that's where we get into organization. And for me, organizing documents comes down to two main things having a consistent and descriptive naming convention, and having some sort of organizational or folder structure that works well for you. And I wanna talk about naming first, because for me, having a consistent and descriptive naming convention is one of the biggest things you can do to be able to find your documents later. There's all sorts of different ways you can do it. There's no right way to name your files. For me, I like to do something like have my, the date at the beginning of the file name, because I like to be able to reference my files by date and then give some descriptors. So if I was, say, scanning a Shaw invoice, an invoice for, from a company called Shaw, this might be the file name that I might use for that. For you, it might be something totally different and there's other tricks you can do. What I like to do is I call it think of your future you. 
what are some words that you might use to look for this document later and then work those into your file name. Then when you're looking for those documents in a year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever, chances are whatever you think of to look for the document is gonna be in the name itself. Now, once we've captured our documents and we know what we're gonna name them, then we need to think of where they're going to go. And the first step you wanna do with that is think of where you're going to store them, kind of the platform that they're gonna be stored on and the storage location. So for some people, they like having their documents just stored locally on their computer or their device. They don't feel comfortable sending it anywhere else. So on your Mac or Windows computer, that's one way to go. For others, they go the opposite. They don't wanna have it stored locally at all. They just want it stored in the cloud. Of course, you need to have internet access to get at that information, but then you don't have to worry about local storage. All the stuff around security and access is governed by these cloud providers. For others, and this is what I personally do, they go for a more hybrid model. So they'll store documents local, but then we use a synchronization service like an Evernote, like a Dropbox, like a box, and have it so that whatever you store locally for the documents that you choose, you can have it uploaded to the cloud service and then it's stored locally and available from anywhere. The way you go really depends on how you feel about security, how comfortable you are having information in the cloud, where you need to have access from and who needs to have access from these documents. That's kind of how you decide how to store them. Now, once you know where you're gonna store the information, then it's time to think up a organizational structure. And I wish I could just give you an organizational structure and say, use this, but really we all have different types of documents. We have different types of storage systems and our brains work differently. So what makes sense to me may not make sense to you. Different strategies to go. What I personally do is I like to keep my folders high level. So high level categories for the type of documents that I'm working with, and then maybe some subfolders for the different types of things. So maybe I'll have a client's folder and then a folder for each client, something like that. I try to keep my organizational structure pretty high level because the more subfolders you have, the more clicking around to saving your information and extracting your information. That's just a personal thing. If you like to have tons and tons and tons of folders, that's totally cool. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. It's all just personal preference. And happy to answer any questions about folder structures and stuff like that in the question period if that is something you wanna learn more about. Now, the dirty little secret about going paperless that not a lot of people talk about, but I will talk about it here, is that it can be a pain to scan these documents and then have to name it and then have to file it away to where it goes. And I get asked a lot, do you have to name your files? And of course you don't have to do anything, but I personally find naming the files really important to be able to find them later. Thankfully though, there are some automation tools that make this stuff a lot easier. So for example, there's a text expansion tool like a text expander on the Mac and Windows. Active Words is one on Windows as well. And what you can do is you can type in little snippets of text that automatically expand to larger blocks of text. And this could be a whole different video on its own, but I'm just gonna talk about it in the context of naming paperless documents. So for example, I was saying how I like using the date in my file names. So what I have is a little snippet, say for me it's semicolon DT, and when I type it in, it automatically replaces it with today's date. If I had say a CIBC MasterCard bill, maybe I would type semicolon CM, and it can be whatever you want. This is just something I chose. You don't even have to have semicolons or anything. And it will automatically expand it to CIBC MasterCard. These automation tools, by the way, are absolutely not required for going paperless. It's just if you want to kind of take it to another level. I thought, you know, with the Steve, Steve's audience, I figure we can get a little bit geeky. But if you're finding these automation tools confusing, absolutely don't worry about it. They're not something that's required. It's just if you wanna be a little bit more efficient and productive. Now, the nice thing about these text expansion tools is that you know the name is going to be the same every time. So these are great. But you can even take things a step further. What if instead of you having to use a text expansion tool to name a document, what if your computer could actually look at the documents that you're scanning and downloading 
figure out what it is, and then automatically name it and file it away. This is like the holy grail of going paperless. And there are actually some tools out there that can do it. On the Mac, there's a tool called Hazel, which is really, really great. And on Windows, there's a tool called Drop It, which is not quite as fully functioned as Hazel, but it will do most of what we're about to talk about. So these are automated organizer tools. So for example, just as an example that shows how it works, let's say that I have a bill and it's a national grid bill. What I can do is I can say, hey Hazel, what I want you to do is watch my inbox folder. So watch whatever folder I use to scan my documents to. And I want you to look for a document that say has the word national grid in it. So I know it's a national grid bill. And this is looking in the text of the PDF itself. I want you to look for the text pay this amount so I know it's a bill. And maybe I wanna be safe and say, I want you to look at the account number just so I know this is the right account. You don't have to do this, this is just what I tend to do. And I even want you to make a note of the date so that we can use that date later. And what it can do is it can take a look at that document, it can automatically rename it using your consistent and descriptive naming convention, including using the date from the PDF in most cases. and it will automatically file it away to whatever folder we want it to go to. So these automated organizer tools are great. We can set Hazel up to watch certain folders and then we can just create different rules against that folder. You can do a million things with Hazel and drop it, but we're just talking about how to use it for going paperless. So this is an example of how it might look in Hazel. We're saying if it's a PDF, and if it has those certain words inside the PDF, then rename it and move it away. It's as simple as that. Really easy to set up and use, but really, really powerful. Now, one thing that I always found kind of funny is that when we're going paperless, we can do things like buy a really efficient, powerful scanner. We can create this awesome paperless workflow. We can even have some automation so things get filed away. But then when it comes to looking for information, when we're looking for our paperless documents, we tend to do things the way we've always done them. We'll do the digital equivalent of opening up the old filing cabinet, looking for the folder, looking for the document, and then looking for the text on the document. And I can tell you right now that one of the best things that you can do when it comes to working on your computer more efficiently is to learn how to search. There's ways on Mac, on Windows, in Evernote, whatever platform you use to store your documents, I guarantee you there's some really, really powerful ways to search that are really quite easy. And if you spend, you know, five, 10 minutes learning how to do it, it's really a skill that will pay off for years and years and years to come. And it will allow you to just bring a lot of what we're talking about together. It'll allow you to zoom right to the document that you need right when you need it without having to hunt around. So take some time to learn how to search. It'll pay you off over and over and over again. Now for me, how you capture your documents is not the most important thing. How you organize your documents is not the most important thing. For me, the most important thing is having your documents protected, is keeping your electronic documents safe and secure. And you know, there's that old cliche, maybe you've heard it, that there are two types of hard drives, those that have crashed and those that will crash. And if you feel comfortable, I'd love it if you could share, uh, if you've been through a hard drive, failure and it's not too painful, uh, maybe you could share in the chat what happened uh, because you know misery loves company and we've all been there, it's horrible. But it doesn't have to be as horrible as it could be if we have an effective backup system and an effective protection system set up. So for me, when I think of electronic documents and backing it up, I wanna back up to at least two locations. Have it backed up to at least one local location and really there's no excuse not to do this because it's built right into your Mac, right into Windows. You don't have to go buy any weird software or anything like that. Just get an external hard drive, plug it in, and they both have totally fine backup systems built right in. So that's number one. And number two, you wanna have some sort of offsite backup. So if something happens to your physical location, if you have a fire, flood, theft, chances are whatever happens to your computer is also going to happen to your backup drive. So you wanna have at least one backup offsite. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Probably the easiest is use a, 
online backup service. CrashPlan is a good one. Backblaze is a good one. There's lots of them out there. And if you don't want to use one of these services, there's other options as well. But you want to have at least one copy of your data away from your physical location. There's also other things we can do to protect our electronic documents, which uh, we kind of can't get into too much because of time, but you can encrypt specific documents so that no one can access them, or you can encrypt your entire hard drive, which is generally a pretty good idea. So if somebody gets access to your hard drive, they can't access your information. So to wrap up, we've looked at eliminating paper as much as makes sense. We've looked at creating a paperless workflow to go from capturing information to searching for information and we've looked at protecting your information, keeping your electronic information safe and secure. There can be a lot of different spinning plates and a lot of different ways to go. Really, you can start small. Like I said earlier, use whatever capture device you have available, even your phone. Create a very simple high-level folder structure. You can iterate and change later. And just make sure that those documents are backed up. If nothing else, plug in an external hard drive and start that backup. Everything else you can improve and iterate from there. And Steve and I are here to help you however we can. We're really pleased to let you all, all you folks know that we have reopened the doors for paperless office made easy. So it just, I'm going to just spend three or four minutes now filling you in on the course. Uh, and if you do want to make an investment in yourself and make an investment in your future, and really uh, take advantage of Brooke's uh, incredible understanding and ability to teach uh, the entire world of the paperless uh, paperless lifestyle, really, uh, then this course is for you. We've put about four or 500 people through the course. They've loved it. Uh, so here's here's the deal. It's uh, it's There's eight modules in the course, and we also have two live trainings that are bonuses within the course. The modules go through all of the stuff that Brooke's just talked about. We talk about software. We talk about the hardware. We talk about the systems. We talk about the utilities that you can use and the automation systems that you can put in place. All of that is covered in the course. And actually, let me just jump over and show you the actual, this is the actual module right here. This is the course. It's all hosted in Thinkific. And as you can see, with lesson one is getting ready, getting set up so you can start. Each of the modules in the course has a video from Brooks. We've got a text document that has all of the supporting content in the course. And then there's Steve's sidebar, which is my perspective in my take on what Brooks taught in that lesson. So we go through choosing your scanner and your input devices, organization, workflow, software, using the cloud security and backup, and then everything else goes into the final module. And then we have our, as I say, we have two live trainings. Now the live trainings, the first one is understanding PDF. PDF is such a huge part of archiving all of your content and storing it. It's the format that you're gonna be using going forward. And Brooks does a really good job of explaining the PDF tools and just what PDF, what the format represents to you and how you work with the format. So we have an understanding PDF webinar and we charge $29 for these webinars. We do them as standalone. So they're included as a bonus. And the other bonus is uh, the is going paperless using Evernote as a base. You folks know that I'm a huge fan of Evernote and Brooks likes Evernote a lot. It's not the only tool he uses where it's the only tool that I use. And we've got a, an entire uh, live training on using Evernote for as the base for your paperless lifestyle. So that is all incorporated in the course. Now, the course itself, we uh, I'll get April to put the um, the link in. It'll be it'll appear in the sidebar of your window here. Uh, but the paper, this is the landing page for the course. You can just go through it. It is two forty nine is the price, and we really encourage you to sign up sooner rather than later so you can make sure you take advantage of the live trainings. They happen on July 20th and August the 3rd are the two dates of the live training and uh, of course they will be recorded so you can you can you can reference them afterwards but it's so nice to be uh, incorporated in the live training don't you think and I certainly do. So this landing page basically goes over everything that's to do with the course and of course as with all Dotto, things Dotto Tech, it is uh, there's a hundred percent money back guarantee uh, within thirty days if you find that the course isn't to your liking, which we've had very very few uh, that refunds that we've had to issue over the years. And uh, another big part of the course I should point out is we've got this wonderful uh, Facebook private group, which is the Paperless Office Made Easy group, and this is where we do most of the support. We focus most of the questions into the support area here in in Facebook and it's an active group. You you learn a lot, get a lot of ideas, get a lot of perspective from others. And of course the questions that other people ask 
often end up very relevant for you. So we do continually support the course when the when the when the course is open, and most of that s- support is we push through into the uh, into the Facebook group because it's just it's 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 more valuable to the entire cohort as you go through at that particular time. So that is an overview of the course itself. I don't think that there's anything else I need to tell you about. It, the, the gate, the door, the doors, the, the cart is open. I will turn me back on. And Brooks, I think you have to turn on your camera and mic again because we were in screen share. Not 100% positive, but let's hope that you, let's hope you join us back because I can't answer all these questions. We need Brooks. Okay. Yes, you are back. Yay. We, are, we have All right. we have liftoff, so let's get back into the questions. So the next right. question so, is Mike asked, uh, "Do you have uh, how how do you back up your cell phone?" Uh, I'm not sure that's too relevant for us. Uh, there are there's a variety of different cell phone backup apps that you can use, and certainly if you're on an iPhone, um, just backing up to iCloud is the best way. Jacob says, "What's the best organizing software for working around the i500 Android Windows combination?" Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no real best software. Uh, I really like one called uh, I really like one called File Center on Windows. And what you can do is you can have it uh, pointed to a folder that is synchronized with, say, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, and access the information on Android for, from there. So, but uh, File Center is definitely my favorite program on Windows. Did you comment yet on uh, or in the chat on the um, the fact that Neat has announced that they're not going to be putting that they're not going to be in the hardware business anymore? Yeah. So basically in the last year or so, I've got a flood of people coming to my my website, uh, not happy with NEAT. (laughs) And basically it started with them uh, discontinuing their desktop software and trying to more and more aggressively push people to their web-based cloud software. And now uh, they've announced that they're getting out of the hardware business altogether. So if you have a NEAT scanner, it'll continue working, but it's not the software is not supported by the company anymore. The desktop software, they want you to be using their cloud software. So a lot of people are not happy about that for obvious reasons, but, uh, and a lot of people are looking for an exit out of, out of the neat ecosystem altogether because of that. Okay. Rich is asking if you have lots of paper to scan, is it better to scan one piece and classify it or bulk do all the work uh, currently scan everything in and then do all the classifications? Yeah, so this is sad. Uh, this just shows how sad my life is. But I actually tested this one once. I sat there with a stopwatch and I tested because I was curious, always curious about this, which is actually faster. Because um, I always assumed my way was faster, but I thought I'm going to actually figure this out. So it turns out that uh, scanning in bulk is actually slightly faster, like a little bit faster than scanning one by one. But the nice thing about scanning in bulk is it allows you to do a lot of the automation things that we that I talked about, you know, using Hazel or what or or whatever. And that makes it dramatically faster. So if you're going to be using automation, uh, I definitely recommend scanning in bulk and then going through and and naming. Good. David asks if there's any machine learning software that's entry level. And really, is that what we classify as Hazel? Um, probably not because with Hazel, you're defining the rules, but there are tools like Devin think on the Mac, for example, that does do some, uh, artificial intelligence type stuff where it tries to figure out what your documents are and it learns over time. So that would be one example. I'm not sure of a windows example. Good enough. Uh, John would love some advice on what documents should not be stored online. I use Evernote in a phone to get a lot of stuff. Uh, accessible everywhere, but I don't know what I should not give Evernote uh, to, you know, things like bank statements and stuff. And so uh, do you have any, do you have some quick advice on that? Uh, yeah, some, it really depends on your personal preference. Some, some people just throw everything in there and no problem. Other people uh, choose not to put anything with any personally identified available information. And some people are kind of in the spectrum. So it really depends on how nervous you are about putting information into the cloud in general. Yeah. And that's, and the nice thing about Evernote and is you can, if you, you can set up some file, file of notebooks to sync and other ones not to sync and any personal information, you can still use Evernote and you set it up as non-syncing and then it will merely remain in your, um, 
it will remain on your uh, on your computer, but not yep. in the cloud. So you're Definitely. a lot more secure, which is better for phone scanning, doc scan, cam scan, or genius scan. I think that's a personal preference in a lot of cases. Yeah. Really. Nowadays, a lot of the apps are pretty similar. I actually really like Genius Scan. It's one of the first scanning apps I ever used, and they put a lot of work into making it easy. So, of those three, I, I like Genius Scan a lot. But I, but you know, it's really personal preference. Yeah, I'm a scan. I'm a scannable guy, and I do like uh, Microsoft's um, Office Lens. Yeah, Office Lens is good too. Yeah. Okay. Next is. Um, uh, do you scan as a PDF or image doc? If you use Evernote, which is better? Uh, I always use PDF for, for scanning documents. The one exception is handwritten notes. Evernote can search handwritten notes, which is pretty amazing, but that only works on uh, JPEGs. So those I scan JPEGs, but everything else PDF. Good stuff. As a research info hoarder, how do you handle documents that have been saved prior to implementation in a naming and filing convention? Hmm. Um, it's up to you. Some people choose to only worry about new documents going forward. Uh, other people just make it a project a little bit at a time to go back and clean up the old ones. It depends how important those old ones are to you, really. Good. Uh, JT is saying that this is all flying by fast. And I wonder if we would recap all of the keys. Uh, well, certainly you will be able to watch the webinar again. Um, yeah, but there was a lot of information that went by quite quickly. <laughs> That's just the nature of it. So there we go. Uh, we, uh, Nikki says, how would you suggest storing central docs for a team? I've been using Google Drive for my small team, which is helpful, but they are in on my drive and shared with others. Great for collaborating, but what about complete finished docs? Any suggestions? Um, there's lots of different services that work well for this. Google Drive is one one that works really well. There's Dropbox for business. There's Box. Uh, some people, this again is total personal preference. Some people prefer to keep their work in process files separate from their kind of finalized documents. That's what I personally do. I don't, I don't keep them together. Um, really, uh, really it, it's personal preference and whatever works for you. You just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page yeah. uh, and work when you're coming up with your policy for your team of how you're going to work with this stuff, make sure to actually involve the people who work with them in the decision on how you're going to handle them. Don't because what you might want might not work for the people that actually do the work. Yeah, very good. Um, Maeve says, is there a best practice for folder organization? And I'll defer that. We do, but that you can't really cover that right now. That's a fairly detailed conversation, and that's the sort of uh, question that gets answered brilliantly in the course, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Uh, Avram, can you oh, – they also asked him to expand on folder structure. That's just too deep for, the, for, for a webinar right now. We could spend an hour on that. Yeah. Uh, okay, people are asking about recommendations for hardware scanners as the, uh, with NEAT, uh, the demise of NEAT. And I think, you, I think universally – the what the um the Fujitsu is the Fuji is the one that everybody recommends, right? Yeah, that's definitely the most popular one. That's the one I would use. Like I said, if you need um, Twain compatibility, which if you know if you know you need it, you you'll know it. Uh, the Epson scanners are very good as well. Okay, uh, CM saying uh, I seem to need two folder structures hierarchies for one for the scanned documents and the other for digital documents that come in. Do you have any tips on how to address the problem? Um, if you're, if you mean by digital documents, you mean stuff like word documents and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I kind of just talked about it, but it's really personal preference, whether you want to keep them together or apart. I personally keep them apart and that works really well for me. Uh, it's not really a problem, I would say, uh, especially if you use consistent naming. Good. Uh, Nikki's saying, do you have any tagging name conventions? She's asking me that actually. And I do, she's talking about in Evernote because I've, I, I don't know if I've told you Brooks, but I've recently gone from to a basically a no notebook structure. I have two notebooks, an inbox and a, uh, and an archive for the most part. Uh, and I just use tags for all of my organizations. So I use this a system very similar. If you search Michael Hyatt's system online, which is probably the most popular blog post in the history of Evernote, um, he talks about. He talks about his, and I've just taken that convention and customized it for myself. 
Uh, and I actually will be talking about that more next month. Next month is Evernote month on Dotto Tech, uh, and we're going to be relaunching Evernote Made Easy. We have a whole new version that I'm just finishing up now, uh, which is one of the reasons I've been working so hard on my tagging stuff. So yes, we'll be talking about that more in the future here uh, on the webinars. Uh, does anyone use direct to Evernote scanner? My Epson allows it, so I guess this should I should use it more, but it's good to learn some tips. Um, do you use it straight to Evernote? Uh, yeah, I do actually. Uh, on this, I use the ScanSnap, and with the ScanSnap, you can either scan and have it go into the Evernote app, or they have a pretty new feature called ScanSnap Cloud, which allows you to scan directly from the scanner to the cloud, and then it puts it to Evernote. So yeah, I both use both those ways. Yeah, Mary, Mary made me smile. She said she bought Evernote Made Easy, and I gave her freedom. Yay! <laughs> Yay. That's nice. Um, any opinion about personal cloud as next cloud on own server? Yeah, I, I haven't used next cloud myself, so I don't have any personal comment on that one, but this is something I, I almost mentioned in the presentation, but I d it would just be go down a rabbit hole. I just didn't want, want to go down, but yeah, that's kind of another option beyond uh, synchronization is there are private clouds you can set up own cloud, next cloud, or you can use uh, Resilio, which used to be known as BitTorrent Sync, or you can use like a Synology device, something like that. And it allows you to have your documents stored locally, also synchronize them to say a mobile device, but it doesn't go through the cloud. So that's kind of a, a another option that you can do if you're not comfortable storing things in the cloud. Good. Stephanie is asking if we'll be sending out resources. Um, we'll be sending out a replay uh, of this. Um, all of the resources from it, I don't think we have an actual document with that. I'm um, just trying to think, but the the replay definitely will have all of the you know we we will incorporate as many links from it as as we can, so it'll be a it'll be a modified resource document, Stephanie for sure. Uh, Jerry says comments on Drop It. Did we lose Brooks? Are you still there, Brooks? Of course not. <laughs> of course he's not there. Why would it go smoothly? Brooks, you may need to refresh. It's good that I've been nice and solid. As far as my feed goes, I believe. And Brooks is gone. I wonder if he's talking and he doesn't hear me. Sorry, I, I, everything froze up for you for a while, so you're going to have to repeat that last question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, comments on Drop It. Oh yeah, so Drop It is, I guess you could say a Windows uh, Hazel alternative. It's a Windows free and open source program. So it's not as polished and fully featured as Hazel, but it works pretty well for what you need. So most of, or if not all of what I talked about in the presentation, uh, Drop It will do. And we have a video in the course on using Drop It as well. Uh, Avram asks, Brooks, do you apply your paperless concepts to email? Uh, not really, to be honest. Email is something that I've come to believe is really not worth the time it takes to organize. So I tend to just archive everything uh, and then rely on search when I want to find it. So I guess in a way I do, but I do a lot less organization with email than I do with, with my paperless documents. Well, Brad's asking if you can recommend an encryption app now that Vivio or Vivo is announced it is winding down. Uh, no, Box Cryptor, I think, is the most common one. I, I haven't looked at this in a while. Uh, Box Cryptor is the most common kind of alternative to Vivo. And then, um, yeah, there's lots of Windows ones as well. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, encryption is always an issue. Uh, please say again the good offsite backup. So the name of it, Shalom uh, is asking. Yeah, I use Crash Plan, but Backblaze is an excellent one as well. Those are those are two good ones, but there's lots of other good ones as well. Just have to throw in a, uh, a a platitude that was thrown our way. Dennis says he took the course last year. Highly recommend his home office is clean, neat, and paperless. Huge fan. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, Dennis. Dennis. Uh, not all of us Max. Not all of us use Max. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, for better, for worse, we use Windows examples that OS are appreciated. 
not just in this presentation. Oh, in the course we do, um, Brooks covers off all of the all the operating, well, Windows and Mac. Uh, all of the apps are covered in that. Yeah. So, and, and uh, other than Hazel, I don't think there was anything you talked about that was Mac specific today, was it? Oops. No, just text expander, but that's cross platform now too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah text expander is cross platform. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a nice thing. We did a webinar on that. Yeah. Yeah. How do you create a backup in Evernote? It's uh, Evernote has a backup function, so you can. There's a variety of different ways to backup. The nature of Evernote, though, Peggy, by itself, the fact that it's cloud based means that it's already backed up, and it's backed up on all your devices at that point. So yeah, Evernote's just make sure good. if you use local if you use local. Um, if you use local notebooks, just make sure that your whatever you're using to back up your hard drive is also backing up the folders that Evernote uses to store your data. Yep. So uh, they're asking if either of us, uh, Brad's asking if either of us use a NAS for backup. No, I don't. Well, I use Apple's um, Time Machine. That counts. Yeah, no, I, I've had my finger over the purchase button for a Synology device for yes. uh, probably like Very four nice. years. My my finger has been hovered over the the thing just because I want to play with it, but uh, I don't have one myself. Yeah, those are those are those are nice machines. I would I would definitely enjoy having one of those around, but I haven't purchased one either. For the purpose of security, Howard asks, uh, is there a practical difference between sync such as Dropbox and an online backup? Well, practical. Well, so here's the thing. Um, having, having, I, I always say that synchronization is not backup. So it's better than nothing having a copy of your information in, say, Dropbox or whatever. But the thing is, by its very nature, with say Dropbox, for example, or these sync services, when something gets deleted in one place, it gets deleted everywhere. So I personally recommend having. Uh, backup as well as synchronization um, because it's more tailored for that purpose. Uh, so that's the main difference. Okay. Bob asks a good offsite backup service, and you've mentioned several. So we can go on. Peeny asks, what to do with history? I'm not too sure. Uh, I think it's similar to... It depends what you mean, but it, it's kind of like what we, what we said before, where if having that information organized and digitized and searchable is important to you. You could start a project going back and digitizing that stuff. A lot of people just start with the new stuff and go forward. So it really depends um, how much you you need the information on that old paper. I'm assuming that's what, that's what they mean. Kevin says, given that Evernote automatically does OCR, doesn't that make having a good naming convention uh, and even filing less important? I'll let you answer that and then I'll answer that because you and I are on probably two different pages here. Okay, so <laughs> so a lot of people do take that approach. They're just like, oh, I'll just put it in Evernote and it will be searchable and what's the point in organizing? So I totally get that point of view. For me, for what I call my file cabinet documents, these are the ones I want long-term. I try to think more long-term and future-proofed about these things because what happens if someday I wanna leave Evernote then I've got all these files in there with no names and are not searchable because Evernote searchability is server side. So for me personally, I like to name and OCR them before going into Evernote if, if it is something I want to keep long term. Uh, but that's my approach. Other people have a different approach and there's definitely no right way, except my way is yeah. the right way, not Steve's. I won't even say my way then. But no, I'm I, just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, it's and, and and that is a good point. If you know, you have to have faith. It's a bit of a gamble that Evernote is going to be viable in the future, or you're going to have something that's going to read the Evernote note format for search. But that's exactly what I do, Kevin. Is I rely on search. The issue is if you get too many. Um, the issue is making sure you have context because you'll end up with too many notes, uh, and search becomes a little bit irrelevant when you have like 60 res results coming in. If you're searching for, you know, the uh, invoice or something like that, the word. Uh, so adding tagging for context, I think, is is crucial at that point there. If you're going to be doing that, and that's what, and that's exactly what I do. Uh, just a side note: we have hit the top of the hour. We like to keep these things to an hour if we can. We still have quite a few questions. Brooks, are you okay for another 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, I'm. I'm good. Good. 
Uh, but anybody who does have to leave right now, you will be getting a replay. It should come today. It might not come till tomorrow morning. I've got uh, I've got a busy day for the rest of the day, but you will get a replay uh, link with as many resources as we can pack in. And there's a, a will be a little bit of a follow up sequence of, uh, of emails on this as well, reminding you about the upcoming course, uh, reminding you about the options to join us in the course. So anybody who does have to leave right now, thank you so much. And for the rest of you, we will continue to answer as many questions as we can. Um, what do you use to back up my phone, your phone? I don't use anything to back up my phone. I just use whatever because everything is in cloud services. I use Google services for the most part. Um, Brooks, do you do a phone backup? Uh, well, I just do the iCloud and then yeah. every once in a while I will back it up. I'll plug it into my computer oh, like we did yeah. in, the, in the old days and do a, a local iTunes backup. backup. Uh, but that that's about it as mar- far as my, my phone Goes. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, yeah, the, uh, I, the iTunes one is exactly, it's a good point. That's, I do that as well. Isn't PDF going away as a file format? Ian says. No. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, it, it, it's the opposite. Uh, just using the United States as a, as an example, uh, the federal courts are now uh, requiring that many, many types of filings, and it depends on where you are, but requiring that many filings are done in PDF or PDF A, which is the archival version. Uh, the nice thing about PDF is that it's an open standard. It's not controlled by any particular company. Uh, so no, I would definitely not say that it is going anywhere. Got it. Now we've got a series of questions about the course. Peggy asks, if you took the course, uh, do you get an upgrade? Yes. Everybody who received the course is updated in the new version. Uh, who's already purchased Evernote? Uh, sorry, um, Paperless Office Made Easy. So you will all be incorporated. Greg's asking, is the price in Canadian or U.S. funds? It is U.S. funds. Uh, but Greg, drop us a note. We have a Canadian discount on the full price, not on the Patreon price, but on the full price. We we can offer a Canadian discount. You just have to drop us an email and request that code. Uh, Ken, you purchased the course last year. Can you upgrade it? You are upgraded for free. Uh, does course cost the same for patrons? No, our patrons have a discount. Uh, all of our Patreon supporters have a discount and they will get that code uh, just by dropping us a note in Patreon and we will send that to them as well. And that's the only discounts that are available. And you should know that we don't... Uh, we won't be uh, playing games with the pricing on this course, and don't worry that next week it's going to be available for less or that sort of thing. We we pretty much set a price and we stay with it. I don't like the I don't like the internet games that a lot of online marketers play with moving pricing around, and uh, so we try and make our value consistent and our pricing consistent. So that's just a philosophy that we do. All right, what's the best way to capture signatures from customers? Gerald asks. A little bit outside of our sweet spot, but go ahead. Yeah, lots of. Uh... If you're going to do that, I would recommend using uh, a service that's made for that. DocuSign is probably one of the most popular ones. Uh, HelloSign is another good one, too. So those are two that you can look at. Or um, Adobe has their own document cloud uh, built in as well. So if you're already in the Adobe world, you could look into that. But that's a uh, you can get a lot of productivity benefits from that. Dennis is asking the difference between scanning PDF and doc image for Evernote. Uh, Yeah, we kind of talked about that, but uh, you want to scan PDF for documents and JPEG for handwritten notes if if you want uh, your handwritten notes to be searchable. I think we covered this as well. Steve's asking if you have personal experience with DropIt and File Juggler. And you said no for DropIt, so you can't really compare, right? Uh, No, I've used both. Um, Okay. So DropIt is open source. Uh, File Juggler is a paid product. Uh, I haven't really used the latest version. Um, The developer kind of disappeared for a while. So that's kind of why I stopped recommending File Juggler. Uh, But the new version looks nice. I just haven't played with it yet. And and those are both Windows Hazel alternatives. Good. Kim says, hey, Brooks, uh, I know you're a scan, but oh, that we've already covered that one. We're getting some coming back that we had before. Uh, what's the best organized? Oh, we've these we've answered already. Charlie's asking, how do we get our Patreon discount code for the course? Just, uh, just add, we'll post it in Patreon. I'll, I'll do a post, a general post in Patreon announcing the course, and and it'll the code will be there, or you can just drop us a note in Patreon, Charlie. We'll let you know. Uh, okay, we've covered that. Covered. Covered. Sorry. I 
think we've covered that. Uh, Ian asked, PDF has been known to carry viruses. Security is an issue. How can PDF be locked down and searchable? How can PDF be locked? How can it be locked down and searchable at the same time? I I haven't heard too much about it carrying viruses, at least not into my system. Have you heard much about that, Brooks? No, it it, it has happened. There have been some malicious PDFs, but uh, that's like any other file uh, file type. But you can make a PDF uh, read only or make it so that you can't uh, copy information out of it. Uh, and you do that with a PDF app like Adobe Acrobat or uh, Preview on Mac has that built in or PDF Pen uh, on the Mac as well. Bill M. Moore asks, do you recommend compressing PDF files to save space for online storage? I personally don't do that. Storage yeah. nowadays is so, storage is so cheap, is so yeah. cheap and uh, plentiful. It, to me, right. it's not worth the effort, but it's, if you want to do it, uh, there's no reason why not. Is the Evernote scanner with their software better than the comparable Epson scanner? Uh, well, the Evernote scanner, I don't believe is available for sale anymore. I could be totally wrong on that, but I don't think it is. Um, no, it's more tightly integrated with Evernote, I will say that. Uh, but better, um, the hardware-wise, it's better because it's basically a ScanSnap iX500. Uh, but they're both great scanners. Okay. Uh, we've done that. Okay. Any Devon Think office tips? They don't give you any starting point. Um, I haven't heavily used Devon Think myself. I've played with it a little bit, but there's a resource I really like. It's a it's an ebook by Joe Kissel called "Take Control of Devon Think," um, and that is a, a good primer for Devon Think. I think it's like ten bucks or something like that. So if you really want to become a Devon Think expert, that could be an option for you. Okay. Uh, Nico asks, Brooks, have you ever looked at metamorphose, metamorph metamorphose on Windows? No, I or haven't. Uh, I was, was going to flip to another tab to look at it, but last time I did that, you totally froze up. So <laughs> I'm, not <touching> my <laughs> I'm not touching my browser at the moment. <laughs> uh, so I've made a note to look into it because it sounds interesting. Okay. Neil says, what about encryption on Evernote? Ah, the, the Evernote encryption question. Um, well, uh, it used to be the big problem with Evernote. It depends what you're talking about, but it used to be the big problem with Evernote is that your documents weren't encrypted at rest. Since they moved over to Google's infrastructure, I believe that's no longer true. I believe Google Google's uh, service server is encrypted at rest. Um, so that's that's a little bit better. Um, what some people choose to do is encrypt their PDFs themselves before uploading it to Evernote. So it's just up to you whether you want to do that. Good. Kathy asked, what about Lima? L-I-M-A? -A? Yeah, I haven't. That's another one that uh, I can't per look up at the moment, but uh, I, I haven't used myself. So I've made a note to check into that. I don't have personal experience with that. For business, is a paperless environment acceptable for meeting government requirements for document retention? Uh, well, that really depends on a lot of things. It depends on yeah. the type of documents. It depends on the type of business. It depends on where you live. So I would definitely check with um, you know your regulators in your particular area. But in more and more cases, it's becoming yes. But you definitely don't want to take our advice on that particular topic. You want to look into that one with a with a professional. Jennifer says, my husband found a 2014 EV scanner at our local dump and it works. <laughs> Is there anything we should be concerned about or did we just score a beautiful scanner for free? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by EV scanner, but if it if you mean I think. the ScanSnap Evernote edition, uh, that would be <laughs> that would be a pretty amazing dump find. So I can't imagine what you'd be concerned about there. So. Well, I'd be concerned about my husband rooting around the dump to find things. But other than that... Hey, it, it worked in this case. So. <laughs> in that particular case. Mary Jo asks, what is the 321 system? All right, so this is uh, from memory since I can't flip to another tab, but the 321 system is basically a rule of thumb for doing backups. Uh, and from memory, what it is, is you want three different copies of your data at all, all times. Yes. So the easiest way to do that is to have data on your, on your computer or device on a local backup and a offsite backup. 
So that's the three. The two is you want it in two different formats. So it could be local and on an external backup drive or something like that. And then the one, you want at least one of those backups to be offsite. Off yeah. So that's the three, two, one. So if you follow those rules, chances are you're gonna be okay if if one or more of those uh, systems fall down. So So again, there's three backups two of which are local, one can be your computer, one can be a local hard drive backup, and one offsite. Then you're covered. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. And Brooks Sander says, which do you recommend for converting, or what tool do you recommend for converting a PDF to a PDF slash A format? Um, well, on Mac, PDF Pen uh, will do that. And on Windows, Adobe Acrobat or Nitro will do that. So those are two options. Excellent. Okay, so that brings us to the last of the questions that I think we have. And uh, we've still got 200 plus people on the line. Brooks, thank you very much. This has been an awesome, awesome webinar. I think uh, other than a few technical issues, uh, it was it was rocking. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone, and uh, apologies for the technical issues. I'm gonna throw my computer out the window as soon as we. Finish I don't this, think but... it's your computer. I think it's your it's your service. Who's? Yeah, I never mind who your carrier is. I already know who your carrier is. Yeah. Yes. Maybe it's going on in my neighborhood. East. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the problem. But listen, thank you very much. Thanks to April who uh, has been ha handling the room. To all of you for the great question and the great um, the great input, and uh, you basically made this webinar. A, uh, I think a, a, a worthwhile experience for us all. We learned a lot. I learned a few things as well with the questions that came down the pipe. So thank you very much. Webinar replay will be on its way to you very shortly. Uh, Brooks, thank you, sir. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, folks. Till next time. Well, next week we're going to be talking about Patreon and crowdfunding on Webinar Wednesday, but we'll be sending you out an invitation to that. Uh, to all of the new people joining us on Patreon, thank you very much. And for the people signing up for the course, welcome aboard. Until next time. I'm Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle. <laughs>